Today, we will learn about therapy. So let's say you have some kind of psychological problem. So a problem with your thoughts, your feelings, or your behavior. Let's take a common example of depression. What you see here is the diagnostic criteria from the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the, the diagnostic criteria for depression. And so for somebody to be diagnosed with depression by a qualified professional, they have to experience five or more of these eight symptoms during the same two week period and at least one of, the system has, one of the symptoms has to be depressed mood, and another one has to be anhedonia, the loss of interest or pleasure. That is, um, thank you, um, that is a lot of different permutations. There are a lot of different ways you could meet these criteria. So depression would look different in different people. And it's not as easy to diagnose depression as it is to diagnose, say, type 1 diabetes, which you could do with a blood test, you know, looking for ketones and glucose and C-peptides. This is a lot more subjective. And so different clinicians will give different diagnoses. <clears throat> if you go get a second opinion on a diagnosis from a different provider, it might not be the same because that other provider might say, you know, that's not depression, it's dysthymia, which is kind of a milder diagnosis. Um, it might say it's something else or that you're okay and have no diagnoses. Um, actually, you know what, that last one is probably the least likely to happen uh, because, well, then, then you wouldn't be a very good therapy client. Anyway, my point is, Diagnoses can differ because of this subjectivity, which arises based on the different tools people use and, and the reliability and validity of those tools. The questions they ask. Right? Do they only ask you the questions or are they also gonna ask people in your family? Okay. Um, how do they interpret your answers to those questions? And your answers to the same questions might vary, right, when you're asked the same question twice, depending on how you're interpreting, depending on your mood at the moment. So you have this issue, you know, what, what are you going to do about it? Well, that depends on what you think the cause of the problem is. So, if it's evil spirits, maybe you want to drill a hole in the person's skull so that the evil spirits could be let out. If the problem is some imbalance in the humors in their blood, they have too much of the melancholy humor, maybe you want to cut their vein and let some of the blood out to restore the appropriate balance of the humors what barbers used to do. Or if it's demons, could be demons. Well, then you need to do an exorcism. So these are all ways that we've treated mental illnesses in the past. But with your modern knowledge of psychology, what, what do you think might cause depression? Yes. Isolation. Isolation. Yes. Sure. Rejection and exclusion isn't very nice either. Even if people don't isolate you, if they bully you and are mean to you, that can really hurt. What else? Sure, maybe there's some problem with uh, the balance of neurotransmitters. This 
sounds very biological and this sounds very social. You know, maybe there could be more than one cause of the problem. So the neurotransmitter imbalance, maybe there's no, not enough serotonin. Does it have to be serotonin? Norepinephrine. Yeah, maybe it's norepinephrine. Yeah, good question. Um, any, any other things, things that can cause depression? Yes. Um, an unhealthy diet? Poor health can get to you. So, the poor health could be associated with a lack of. Uh, yes, right be associated with a poor diet, maybe you're not getting the dietary precursors that your body needs to build all those nice neurotransmitters, you could have some kind of a nutritional deficiency. If you look up uh, symptoms of, say, scurvy, one of them would be depression. Okay, so poor diet, poor nutrition, nutritional deficiencies. Yes? Uh, more stimulation or burnout. Could be burnout, burnout from stress. And, and back to the poor diet, sometimes people have food sensitivities which cause these inflammatory reactions, and that makes them feel terrible and get worn down. Anything else? Yes. Disorders. Yeah, comorbidities are common with depression because depression is like a really low mood, low energy state. And there are things that can happen that wear you down into that place. So some of that burnout from stress could involve comorbidity. So the spell that. <laughs> M-O-R-M-O-R-B-I-D. There's a very strong correlation between anxiety and depression. It's about 80%. Imagine if you're picked up and anxious a lot, it might wear you out, and then you go and have a depressive episode. We're still missing one major prediction. Uh, one major predictor, yes? Abuse or trauma. Trauma. Yeah. That's like a really long term stressor. Is a hand behind you? Yes. Uh, non sleep. Yes! Strong predictor of depression. It's one clinician that uh, always wants to know uh, whether people are getting enough sleep. Because how are you going to talk somebody out of their depression if the problem is that they're just sleep deprived? Do you have another one? Yes. Jets. Jets? Yeah. Sure. Some people are more likely to be sad as a matter of temperament. They can run in families. Maybe it relates to that neurotransmitter imbalance. Maybe they genetically need more sleep and they're not getting it. Yes? Drug use. Drug use. Um, using drugs that make you feel really good have after effects where they make you feel really and that could contribute to a person getting wearing down, that can contribute to their stress. Uh, drug use also causes a lot of other problems in people's lives that, that make them feel bad. So I will add drug use. Like cocaine has a dopamine that should have Yeah, yeah. So after using it, it can feel pretty bad. I think hand there first and then here. Yes? Um, I know seasonal affective disorders tend to be something that Yeah. Yeah, so it can have something to do with the environment, sort of environmental deprivation. It's something to do with sunlight. Sunlight releases endorphins, makes us feel happy. Yes? Uh, social, cultural? Cultural, um, and because people are being maybe excluded in their culture. Well, I mean, for example, like a, like a lot of men uh, secluded by themselves. So men, you know, interesting. So that, hmm, 
So this that isolation and exclusion is a social issue that leads to their sort of community. Sorry, the arrow should be going the other way. Social and community issues leading experiencing discrimination isn't a lot of fun for people either. It makes them feel pretty terrible. Yes. Uh, for withdrawal abuse, can you say withdrawal? Because people want to withdraw the drugs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> drug abuse is going to cause a lot of problems in addition to withdrawal. So um, you might experience something that looks like depression as a consequence of long-term effects of the drugs on your neurotransmitters. But it's also maybe going to lead to you losing your job and your friends and your your family. So the withdrawal, uh, interpersonal problems. Remember that relationships are your biggest predictor of happiness. So somebody who has a lot of relationship problems isn't going to be very happy. Yes. Sorry. Pregnancy or menopause? Yeah. So these hormonal fluctuations are associated with depression. So not just the neurotransmitter imbalances, it can also have to do with hormones. I don't know if imbalance is the right word. I'm going to say issues. That's a lot of things. If somebody comes to see you because they're feeling depressed, there are a lot of things you could be talking about. So your approach to treatment is going to have something to do with what you think the problem is. And there could be a lot of problems. There could be many causes, not just one. Now. Some of these problems sound kind of biological. Sleep deprivation, poor nutrition, sensitivities, maybe deficiencies. Some of them sound kind of psychological. Burnout from stress, maybe relationship issues. And some of them sound like they're, there's a social or a cultural level, maybe isolation, exclusion, discrimination. And different kinds of psychologists tend to specialize at different levels of the problem. Um, there are bio biomedical therapies that address those biological roots of a problem. There are medical procedures, pills, injections. B vitamins can actually make quite a, a big difference. Not a lot of people that get a, a B shot and then feel a lot better afterwards. Um, and psychologists are not licensed to prescribe medications. However, psychologists and counselors can be part of a bigger care team that also includes doctors or psychiatrists, nurses, maybe social workers. So psychologists can make referrals when they can't provide a certain kind of treatment themselves. And the psychologists and counselors do something we'll loosely call psychotherapy. That is, you know, about helping people with their psychological problem, basically by talking about it and using psychological techniques of some kind. Sometimes these are cognitive, sometimes they're behavioral, sometimes they're both. Um, and many people combine different of therapies into an eclectic approach. The medical model for mental illness refers to the idea that diseases have physical causes. It can be diagnosed and treated and in many cases cured, maybe through some kind of medical treatment in a clinical kind of setting. That's the medical model. And it was it came to be applied to mental illness historically through the social experience of syphilis. Syphilis is easily treated now. However, it used to be a really big deal. It was the great pox. 
People didn't know what caused it, but it was associated with sex and with madness. It was a subject of mystery and fear and a lot of social taboos. And to the Turks, it was known as the Christian disease. And in India, the Hindus and the Muslims named the disease after each other. Um, as syphilis advances, it affects the brain. Okay? And it leads to all kinds of psychiatric symptoms, delusions and dementia, mania, depression, depending on you know, what part of your brain it's affecting. Then they, they figured out syphilis. The, the bacterium was isolated from neurosyphilitic people's brains in 1905. And the treatment was discovered soon after that. Is that penicillin, I think? Anyway, that impressed us with the idea that mental disorders, mental problems, can have a treatable physical origin. And, well, we know that every thought or feeling comes with some kind of a biological event. Okay. Brain activity does differ in depressed people. It seems slowed, the left frontal lobe seems less active. As you mentioned, there's some changes in neurotransmitter levels. Okay. So we could take a biological lens to look at depression and to treat it. But might not be the whole story behind what's going on. The first line of biomedical therapy is therapeutic lifestyle change. This is something that a psychologist can prescribe. It's really important that people are getting enough sleep. Sometimes people come in, they're depressed, they don't know why. Psychologists might ask them to track their food intake and it seems that they're so busy they're only eating 800 calories. And that's the problem. If you start eating less, you get used to it, and you eat less and less, and you're not feeling tired and fatigued, you don't really know why, it can happen to people. And so a biomedical, uh, sorry, therapeutic lifestyle change intervention would be to eat enough, right? and sleep enough, and, and exercise enough in order to try to restore a, a biologically healthy state. And, you know, most people aren't doing all of those things. Right? Most of us are eating a lot of junk and uh, leading sedentary lives and not sleeping enough. Scrolling your phone before you go to bed. So if somebody's depressed for these reasons, talking to them about their early relationship with their mother isn't going to get you that far. There are drugs that are prescribed that treat mental disorders, okay, and they affect neurotransmitter levels, okay, agonists or as antagonists. Um, medication is strongly indicated for some mental disorders, say bipolar disorder. People can do very dangerous things in a manic episode. But some people choose not to treat their mental illnesses using drugs because there can be a lot of um, adverse effects. They may not want to mess with your neurotransmitter levels. Um, antidepressants seem to function to increase people's activity levels. There are experiments called forced swim tests where you put an unfortunate rodent into water and you can observe their behavior and watch what they do. Do they just give up hope and drown? Or do they keep fighting and struggling? And how? Is it by swimming? Is it by trying to climb? Or how long do they do that? And you can put the rodents on different antidepressants. I'll look at what they do in the force swim tests. 
try to get an idea of what this antidepressant does. It seems that antidepressants increase certain behaviors, and, and different antidepressants uh, will increase different kinds of behaviors. Uh, like this one is associated with more swimming, and this one is associated with more climbing. If you've ever taken an antidepressant, you might have seen a warning like this on the leaflet inside. What could be going on there? Why would, how could an antidepressant cause suicidal thoughts and behaviors? Seems kind of counterintuitive. Reaction? Some kind of reaction, but what's, tell me more, what's going on? Yes? Maybe the wrong drug for it, like I know with women, different drugs are better with their hormones than men. Interesting. So, yeah. The different variety of antidepressants, you mm -hmm. play with them until you find one that actually yeah. betters your mood. Yeah. Make it. My mom needed that, and she's doing much better on a particular kind of tricyclic antidepressant, but there were a few before that that seemed to make things worse or not work at all. And your friend might take something that works really well for them. It doesn't work for you. So antidepressants function to increase people's their level of behavioral activation. And let's say you give an antidepressant to somebody who's suicidal. What kind of thoughts are they having? What kind of plans might they have? And now you're giving them a bit more energy to carry those plans through. And so that's why it's really important that antidepressants are paired with psychological therapy as well, so you can talk to the person about their thoughts and their feelings and plans and maybe help them with unhelpful thoughts and maladaptively applied emotions. Yes? Thoughts are just thoughts. It's not real. Thoughts are, sorry, say that again? I said thoughts are just thoughts. They're not real. It's, the, it's like an ideation. It doesn't necessarily put it into emotion. So let's say that somebody is feeling sad and um, they're thinking about suicide, maybe planning it. If they're really depressed, they might not have the energy or the emotional wherewithal to come through on that plan. But now you've gone and, and changed one little thing, which is the level of the neurotransmitter, and that increased that gave them a bit more energy to do some things. Maybe it didn't do anything to change the way they're thinking. Maybe it didn't do much to their emotion. It just gave them a bit more energy. Because when you're depressed, you're not really low energy. And what is the person who's still having those thoughts and feelings going to do once you have boosted their energy level? But the thought of death could be more severe than the thought of taking life. Sorry, I can't hear you very well. I don't have to I'm not really following. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm trying, I think what I'm trying to say is that there's a, a risk. You see this risk of um, suit increased. Oh, now I understand your point. Okay, sorry, it took me a second to connect that. Um, there is an increase in, in suicidal behavior, be it an increase in suicidal thinking, because you, you've increased like brain activity. Like they're going to be having more thoughts. But you haven't addressed everything. You're still having these sort of, let's say, sad thoughts, or um, maybe they're, they still have attitudes that are maladaptive that haven't been addressed by that help. And so the point I'm trying to make here is that if you only try to change one thing like a neurotransmitter, you might not you don't know what you're doing in the context of that whole person and everything that's going on. And that can lead to four outcomes. So it's an important it's important to keep an eye on, on all of these things. 
you can see how that's, that's a full-time job. There are also neurostimulation therapies where we can stimulate different parts of your brain. And you could do that through electroconvulsive therapy. That's that sort of really dramatic thing where they apply shocks to people's brains. Looks more dramatic in movies. It is an effective treatment for depression that has not responded to other interventions. Say the psychotherapy doesn't work and the antidepressant doesn't work. And okay, then uh, people might consider an intervention like this. Um, and there are other ways that you read about in your textbook about how, um, I guess, neuroscientists can stimulate uh, different parts of the brain. And so maybe um, you could affect parts of the brain that are known to be associated with positive, pleasant moods or with, with sad moods. And um, applying a current can disrupt the way those neurons are functioning. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to go back there. I feel like I missed something. Yeah. So um, the neurostimulation therapies would apply some kind of electricity or magnetic energy to the skull surface or even directly to like the a neuron if you're using, let's say, um, if there's implanted electrodes. And that can work by scrambling things, by, by inhibition. Now let's say we get into more and more dramatic interventions. Psychosurgery removes or destroys brain tissue in an effort to change behavior. That is like a last line there, not a first line there, because it's irreversible and, and things can be, can go wrong. And in the past, sometimes they uh, severed the corpus callosum in people who had very severe schizophrenia to reduce their seizures, resulting in a person with kind of a split brain. The, the left and the right hemispheres are working separately and can't communicate with each other. That's done less often today because of advances in medication. At one point, a lobotomy was supposed to be the, the cure for mental illness. There's a famous example in, in Rosemary Kennedy. She has some form of intellectual disability, and this was a bit embarrassing to her family. And she was in a convent school, and they, uh, they worried about her behavior, they worried that uh, she could be involved with sexual partners, you know, she could get pregnant or get an STI. Sometimes her behavior was a bit like, erratic, and uh, her father was really worried that her behavior could shame and embarrass the family right? and damage his and his children's political careers. And sometimes people with disabilities are constructed as sort of disruptive and inconvenient and, and a risk we have to do something about this. And um, she was lobotomized. You can uh, read about the procedure there. So they kind of put a knife in her brain and, and cut. And swung it up and down to cut brain tissue. And uh, they asked her questions and made an estimate on how far to cut based on how she responded. And they stopped when uh, she began to become incoherent. She never recovered from that. She did relearn to walk. Did not learn how to speak again. And her parents, um, I don't think her, her father visited her again. It took her mother 20 years to visit. And she did die at the age of 84 in the institution. That's a sad story. And I hope there's better ways to treat people with intellectual disabilities than that. And you know, like, let's say that the worst thing had happened and she got pregnant. They would have had another grandchild. The psychological model of mental illness has a history, too. Maybe you've heard of uh, the idea of hysteria. 
Part of hysteria. Yes, yes what's hysteria? It does come from the It does get hysterium. And, uh, well, I suppose that, uh, Greek ancient doctors observed that, you know, women can be emotional and crazy, and this could be caused by the uterus wandering around. Okay. And, uh, so the, the Egyptians, ancient Egyptians, attributed these feminine behavioral disturbances to the wandering uterus, and to treat it, so the doctors would, um, or well, prescribe various medications. It might like put a strong spelling um, substance on the vulva to um, entice the uterus to you know, come back down. Maybe it's been running around your head. I don't know. Um, so, so another tactic was to smell or swallow unsavory herbs. Um, and maybe that would make it flee back to its um, sort of proper position in the body. Um, Jean-Martin Charcot um, had studied, studied this, and uh, he could uh, get women to demonstrate these uh, fits in front of all these interested psychologists, I suppose. Um, so Charcot would put on these public events every Thursday, and he would uh, hypnotize female patients and to pr provoke these hysterical fits for the, the fascinated audience. Okay, and that audience included um, many great minds of the day, a Sigmund Freud, and Emil Durkheim, the father of sociology. And uh, Sherko had, had a few sort of star patients who were particularly good at performing the four stages of hysteria. We'll talk about hypnosis in another unit, but it is possible for various reasons to put people in a state where they're very responsive to suggestions, and they essentially do what the hypnotist wants them to do, and in this case, he wants them to demonstrate the four stages of hysteria. And so they did. This is a picture of Sigmund Freud's office. And if you look over the couch that the patients lay on, you see a picture there. And that is this picture. Okay. So now let's say, OK, we know hysteria tells us that the disorder is in somebody's head. Okay. And well, then that would lead to a need for psychological treatment. I'll loosely call it psychotherapy. And so the psychotherapist gets in your head and analyzes the workings of the mind. And my, well, early psychodynamic psychotherapists thought that um, the mental illnesses were caused by some kind of an inner conflict, an immediate conflict between what you really want and what you were allowed to do and so trying to suppress this conflict, it's coming up sideways, but uh, maybe they can detect this and talk to you about it, and you can uh, somehow resolve the conflict. So uh, the goal of psychodynamic therapy is to help people understand their current symptoms and uh, explore and gain perspective on these suppressed or defended against feelings. This is kind of puts the therapist in a position where they know better. They say, ah, you know, this is a conflict. And if you say, no, I don't think that's true, well, you know, you're just suppressing that, you're denying it. Um, so the techniques involve psychoanalysis. I think that's when a person would engage in, well, they would just talk. Right, and, and make free associations, and the therapist would sit and listen and, and look for connections in what they're saying. Um, the psychodynamic psychotherapists are very interested in past relationships, especially with, with your parents. What was your relationship with your parents like at the age one or two or three? And were you born through a C-section or naturally delivered? They might focus on, on that. And Maybe this will help the patient to understand how past relationships create themes that are active in present relationships. 
So maybe you have a problem with authority today because your parents are very domineering and you want to drill a bell with your parents. And now that's what you're playing out with your issues with your boss. Uh, I saw a psychodynamic psycho, uh, psychologist for um, some of my own issues with attention. And uh, he was, I wanted to talk about my attentional issue now, like why am I so forgetful? He was, he was very focused on my early experiences. He wanted to talk about um, periods in my life I couldn't even remember, so I had to go and ask my parents. And uh, I remember he seemed uh, to like read a lot into some very specific things. So my favorite thing to do when I was about uh, 18 months old was to uh, turn a key in a lock on the back door back and forth. So I was very interested in the key in the lock playing with that. And um, he made a lot out of that. You know, that it's something about escaping the authority of parents to, to get to freedom. Is he right? I don't know. I can't tell him he's wrong. I mean, I'm the patient. He's the, the expert and the authority. And I told him about other, you know, found out about other things about my, my early childhood. I really like to have garbage, garbage can with a, what do you call those? those spinning lids. And I like to bat it and I would spin around. He wasn't interested in that. Like, he didn't make a big deal about my relationship with garbage. But he did make a big deal about the human law. Now, um, another school in psychology is the behaviorist school. And behaviorists are interested in what you do and observing that objectively. Um, how would that work in therapy? Well, um, we could use classical or operant conditioning techniques. So let's say that somebody has a fear of spiders. So the spiders are paired are here with, with fear. But what could we do about that? Well, we could get somebody into a really relaxed state and then you know, get them to start talking about spiders. And that'll bring up their anxiety. We can sort of bring that back down. We can get them to a place where you are not know, okay with talking about spiders. And start pairing spiders with relaxation. And we can add that up a bit. Maybe we'll show them a picture of a spider. Boom! That gets a reaction. But we can uh, get them to be relaxed again. And keep doing that until they're comfortable with the picture of the spider. And we can keep playing that game until maybe they're okay with looking at a spider behind glass. Maybe it'll come to the point where they can have a tarantula on their hand. For ethical reasons, uh, reasons to do with insurance risk, uh, we'll use, um, what do you call those, virtual reality simulators. Because uh, there could be problems with having a tarantula in your office and putting it on your patient. Uh, so the behavior therapy seems to work well for specific phobias. My, I, I know my father's a clinical psychologist and he enjoyed treating these. And he had a patient who had a fear of walking around the cemetery backwards. One of his favorite appointments was to walk around the, the cemetery, Campbell Cemetery, counterclock. No, it wasn't backwards, it was counterclockwise. Just sort of tossed it out. And some people are afraid of elevators, other things like that. And what about operant conditioning? How can we use operant conditioning? Well, there are these token economies. And we, we could reinforce a desired behavior by giving people a reward. If, uh, I don't know, if it's ethical, maybe there's, and you have the power and control, maybe there's a way you could punish them for engaging in the undesired behavior. You see more of these token economies in situations where the person doing the therapy has a lot of control. So you see it in um, parents and children, you see it in um, elementary classrooms, see it in hospitals, in patient settings, and in prisons. Yes? Like the book says, it's a bit authoritarian. Yeah. Yeah. It is. And so um, you might wonder how will this work when you're no longer in a position to uh, administer the rewards and punishments. You know, what happens when they get out of jail? 
But that, that is, is a, a, a teddy. This is, is a kind of fair um, so, so you, you might, might wonder how, how durable the behavior change would be. And you might wonder, wonder whether people will become so dependent, dependent on the extrinsic rewards that the desired behavior would stop when the reinforcers stop. So, so like, you know, when you take the sticker chart away, the sticker is my goal. You know, James go back to jumping out of his seat. If you want people to be self-managed and independent, at the end of the day, you need to connect it's like, like to their own inherent drives and motivations. Uh, there's, there's a question. Do I have a No? OK. And imagine that. Now, now uh, something, something we didn't think out with depression, depression is, is how people think. Okay. What are their attitudes? Okay. What are their cognitions? What if they're telling themselves, I am worthless. I can't do anything right. And depressed people tend to see themselves and others and the world in a kind of negative light. Um, there is a phenomenon that I think was a behaviorist psychologist discovered called Learn Helps. So they talk about Martin Seligman and his dog experiment with yoke pairs. He had um, trained some, some dogs, dogs to push a lever, lever to turn off shock, but he had the cages connected in such a way so that there are other dogs that received the exact same shocks, but there was no connection to a lever or any control in doing something about it. And so when he put the dogs in a new situation, tried to teach them to jump over a hurdle to avoid shock, but the ones that he had initially trained to push the lever could learn that really quickly. The other dogs, the yoke pairs, would just receive the shocks. Had a hard, hard time learning that task. They just kind of lay down and gave up. Because they, they had learned, learned something. They had learned, learned that what they do doesn't matter. matter. So, so why bother? Just give up. Okay. So, so maybe, maybe there's something about the way the depressed person is thinking that would change. change. Maybe, maybe they, they believe things that you should challenge. And maybe, maybe they believe that they can't do anything right. right? Isn't that really true? true? You could have, have that argument with your mind. Um, we, we speak, speak of, of uh, sort of depressed thoughts and as, as if, if they, they had, had no adaptive, adaptive value, value, but, well, um, sometimes depressed people seem to be more accurate in their appraisals, where other people are optimistic and see the world through rose-colored glasses. Maybe they have some capacity for critical human that could be applied appropriately if you could train it and develop it somehow. Maybe they didn't have a strength that, well, let's say there's that, that rumination. It's not very helpful if it's kind of narcissistically self-focused on everything wrong they ever did and what other people thought how terrible. But could, could you apply that in some, some better way? way? Right? Could, could they, they work, identify and work through, say, they call like social, social problems? problems? How do you put that rumination? Um, so, so framing, framing matters. Depressed people might like frame things, things in ways that are not adaptive. Let's, Let's say there's, there's a breakup with a romantic partner. partner. It's not very really helpful to tell yourself, no, I'll, I'll never, never get over this. this. A more, a more useful thought, a more adaptive thought, you could be saying, say, no, this, this is hard to take. take. This, this, is, this is hard, but, but you know, I'll get through this. That, that has hope. Um, might, might say to yourself, well, without, without my partner, partner, I can't seem to do anything. anything. It's a maladaptive cognition. It might be more adapted to help a person reframe it as, you know, I miss my partner, but you know, I have family and other friends. And and there's other fish in the sea. And so more adaptive cognitions lead to more successful coping. Now, let's say you're thinking in these maladaptive ways. How is that going to affect you? Could be a spiral. And let's say these unhelpful thoughts lead to a depressed mood. Well, then. Let's, Let's say you stop going to school, school. stop going to class, you say, I'm all there writing my quiz, I'm just going to fail anyway. 
and so we do. Maybe you, you know, are very, very fun for your friends, friends to be around, and they call you less. Now, now you're, you're more isolated. isolated. And, and that, that leads to more stress. stress. And then and you, you apply your maladaptive cognitions to that, and, and you feel it worse, and you kind, kind of get, get stuck in a negative, negative spiral. So, so these therapists recognize that cycle, and they, and they can help people kind of break, break out of it by changing that negative thinking by redirecting their attention outward and trying to get them to engage in more pleasant, more adaptive, more pleasant behavior, more adaptive behavior. Um, now, a, a behavioral therapist might think, well, you know, what, what behavior could we get people to engage in? Uh, going for a walk, behavioral activity, that can help people feel better. But, but let's, let's say, say we're going to focus on, on the cognitions and on thoughts. So, so there, there are cognitive therapies, therapies that challenge those unhelpful thoughts and attitudes and try to teach people new and more adaptive ways of thinking. Okay. And so a famous cognitive therapy was developed by Aaron Beck who used gentle questioning try to get to the bottom of like a rational loss. Try to persuade people to change their perceptions. So let's say you think that no one likes you. Nobody likes me. Oh, well, how do you know? No one likes me. Very sad about that. Well, what would a cognitive therapist do to address that? Oh, well, we could ask questions about it. And how do you know that nobody likes you? Like, like did you poll them? And, you know, is that any of your business, right? Like, aren't other people free of their own thoughts and feelings, okay? Do you need everyone to like you, okay? Or, or let's say you think that everyone should like you, right? Let's sort of test that belief. Like, what, what might your life look like, right? If you had to make everyone like you all of the time. That sounds like it'd be a lot of work. That sounds exhausting, right? Do you really want to do that? Or is it okay to have some people not like you? Uh, would, you would you be effective in your life if you always prioritize making other people like you? Now, sometimes you sort of have to be disagreeable and, and angry. Um, sometimes people might think, well, you know, I can't do it because I might fail. You know, I probably will, right? Yeah, you know, actually, did I fail? You failed? Well, that's great, good job. And you learn something. You learn something about what you're good at, what you're not good at, what you like, what you don't like, about who you are. And what did you learn from that experience? Cognitive and behavioral therapies can be combined right, in, in ways that address people's thoughts and their behaviors. Right? There's an integrative therapy that combines cognitive therapy that's about changing that to self-defeating thinking with behavior therapy, which is about changing people's actions and try to change the way people think and they act. Okay. To help people and make more realistic appraisals and, and act more adaptively. There is a type of CBT called DBT, dialectical behavior therapy. And this is more appropriate for high risk, hard to treat clients. If somebody is suicidal, you can't really say, okay, uh, you know, book another appointment for two months down the road. And they might need a lot more support. Okay. And you know, that can be hard on the practitioner. And maybe the practitioner needs some, some help too. So um, DBT would help the, the patient learn skills to cope with unhealthy behaviors okay, to help them you know accept themselves and also move towards making constructive changes teaches distress tolerance okay, emotion regulation mindfulness also involves um, a group skills training and, and there'd be phone coaching available for the crises that you'd expect to pop up between sessions 
There's also consultation for practitioners on how to manage their cases. Yes? So in Alberta, my son has disabilities. They actually created a whole class at the Catholic school that the children all had an EA and they did the group regulation. And when he came here, he couldn't get the EA. He was okay because he had the tools in the toolbox. But in Alberta, they actually have a separate class to teach regulation and do okay. all this stuff with did it, children. Did, did you find it helpful? Absolutely. <laughs> cool. I've heard things, good things about DBT. I don't know if anyone's ever tried it before. Um, it does work in, in more, more challenging cases. Maybe you've heard about acceptance and commitment therapy. This is another sort of variant of CBT. But in this case, it would be for people um, whose functioning is in, in a more normal range. Um, Acceptance and commitment therapy um, invites people to open up to their unpleasant feelings, right? to learn not to overreact to them, and particularly not to avoid situations um, where they're invoked. So it tries to develop something called psychological flexibility, which is your ability to stay in contact with the present moment, regardless of your unpleasant thoughts, unhelpful thoughts, and feelings, and, and bodily sensations. So you put up with all of that while you choose your behaviors based on the exigencies of the situation, which you are mindfully paying attention to, okay? and, and your personal values. You make decisions that reflect your values. That's how you take each, each step ahead. And the, uh, the metaphor that's associated with um, ACT is passengers on a, on a bus, a bus metaphor. And in this metaphor, you are the bus driver, and the route that you drive the bus is going to follow your values, kind of like wayfinding by the stars, where the stars are your values. That's the direction you go in your life. In, in your career, okay? And you're not the only one on that bus. There's all these passengers, and one of them is your anxiety, and the other one is your sadness, uh, the other one is your critical inner voice, and they're always going to be talking to you. You can't kick them off the bus, right? They're always going to say, maybe this, maybe that, and, and if, you know, what would a good bus driver do? Probably be polite to them. Um, now let's say the anxiety passenger says, oh no, there's, there's going to be a terrible storm. Let's go and, and park the bus in an underground shelter and stay there forever. Uh, maybe you could take some of that information into consideration. You know, maybe it's time to make some change, turn the headlights on, slow down a bit. But, you know, you don't let that passenger drive the bus. Okay? And so um, acceptance and commitment therapy encourages people to be aware of their thoughts and feelings as they sort of pass in and out, like passengers getting on and off a bus. So some meditations that you might do would be thinking of your thoughts like clouds that are passing by, or like plates on a, on a sushi train. And maybe you could, in, you know, just like you could pick up a plate of sushi, you could choose to engage with a certain thought, or you could let it pass by. But the idea isn't to like get rid of them and kick them out. So another way you can think of your, your thoughts is of uh, like leaves in, in, a, in a stream that are running by. And, and what it tries to get people to do is understand that you have all these different thoughts and feelings, and some of them are unpleasant and unhelpful, and you can still do what you need to do. Okay? So it encourages distress tolerance and trying to relate to your unpleasant thoughts and feelings in ways that are more adaptively. Okay, so uh, you don't try to get rid of your negative thoughts and feelings, but to treat them as companions on your journey, right? So you're in charge of the journey, and you kind of treat them with respectful custodianship, right? understanding that healthy emotional life includes negative emotions. And if you relate to them in a way that's adaptive, they can kind of become a resource. But if you mistreat them and try to kick them out, well, don't be surprised if they start turning into monsters. Um, and so compared to DBT, um, actors or clients who are pretty functional, 
way. They're, they're less appropriate for people whose negative thoughts and feelings are like severely dysfunctional. Well, you know, monster is often. There are humanistic therapies that, instead of really focusing on what's wrong with the person, try to focus on potential for growth, for self-actualization. It's about promoting personal growth, reducing inner conflict. They're interfering with that, helping people grow in self-acceptance and self-awareness. And this is very person-centered. We would use the word client um, to indicate a more equal relationship than when we use the word patient. Okay, in that sort of very authoritarian, psychodynamic kind of tradition, you need to call somebody a patient. There's definitely something wrong with them that you, the authority, are going to fix. If you call somebody a client, there's more of a relationship between kind of equals there. Maybe you're a bit more like a consultant than an authority figure. And humanistic therapists would try to help people take appropriate personal responsibility in their lives. The focus would be more on the present and the future than on the past, particularly like the early childhood stuff that the psychodynamic therapists like. Um, a therapist would engage in sort of active listening. Um, they might provide unconditional positive regard. Unconditional positive regard is a therapeutic technique that applies to the therapist-client relationship. It's being kind of positive about the client, their worth and their skills and their hope for their future, either validate their feelings, sort of affirm that their story is important, and go on to do good things. Hmm. It isn't sort of technically unconditional because it would stop if the client stopped paying their bills or drew a gun out in the therapy session or was like so painful to work with that the therapist would sort of decide they'd rather be doing something else. It's kind of an idea, it's a tool, but please don't live your life as if others owed you unconditional positive regard because that's not really realistic, okay? Now, there are some religions that'll teach that God has this for you, but in others, he'll you know, throw you in a, a lake of fire for displacing you. So, unconditional positive regard is a, is a therapeutic technique with some kind of, it's applied within limits, but if we act like we're entitled to this from everyone, then we can have very bad behavior. Now, let's move past the individual level. When people have issues, Oh, maybe it's not just about them, okay? We forget that people come in families. Uh, family therapy is often um, used with children who have some kind of a, a behavior issue, because in that case, like the parents and how the family is functioning really matters. So let's say a child's acting out, well, you know, could that have anything to do with dad's drinking, right? Or, you know, mom not being there. And so, in family therapists, the therapist helps family members understand how their ways of relating to each other could create issues. And they try to change relationships and interactions. Group therapies are used when client problems involve interactions with others, and so it can be helpful to talk about the issue with other people who are having sort of similar experiences. And this can like save therapists a lot of time because you see like five people at once, save the client money. And, uh, and it helps people explore like social behaviors and social skills develop. Um, however, you know, there could be harmful effects. So there have been concerns about uh, using group therapy in, in cases of eating disorders. Where they start like sharing tips and tricks about uh, you know, how they're, they're losing weight. Um, another thing that's good about group therapies is that it provides a lot of feedback from other people who are participating who can provide you know, affirmation, for instance. Then there are self-help groups, okay, small support groups that meet regularly. They tend to focus on specific issues like say addiction or bereavement. And uh, a benefit is that they involve like connection and community. And a lot of these are built out of like 
grassroots understanding of problems. Like with Alcoholics Anonymous is as effective as um, interventions for alcohol use disorders given by sort of licensed psychologists and, and experts. And it comes from people with that condition themselves thinking about their experiences and what they need. And that's, that's pretty powerful. Okay. And so there's, there's good evidence for some of them. Now, you might ask, how do you know if treatment works? And, sorry? I can't hear you. Well, I, I was going to do all this whiteboard stuff, and I was like, uh, I'm on slide 34, 51, and we have like five minutes left. <laughs> yes? I was sitting at work. I had a client with mood disorder. Yeah. And with continuous CBT, he actually started being more open for the session stopped. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear that. Okay, so maybe you noticed some change in the person's behavior. Um, it's hard to tell, and these positive testimonials from the client and the therapist are, well, you could question them, like maybe there's a placebo effect, like maybe you really wanted to believe that there was change. Um, maybe the person paid all this money for therapy and so they really wanted to make it work, right? Um, research indicates that people who don't undergo treatment, don't undergo therapy for the problem, tend to get better anyway, all right? But those who undergo psychotherapy um, tend to improve more quickly and have less chance of a relapse. And so um, these two distribution curves are based on data from 475 studies, and they show the improvement of untreated people versus psychotherapy clients. And so, the, the outcome for the average therapy client surpassed the outcome for about like 80% of untreated people. So these studies suggested that psychotherapy seems to help. But there is a problem because we only really like to publish the studies that find positive effects. Okay. The study gets a null result, well, you know, that's not breaking any news. Maybe the journalism want to publish that study when they can publish, uh, you know, this other breakthrough thing, paper. Okay, so, hmm, that's an issue. It's called the file draw problem. Research has not found any effect of therapist experience, training, supervision, or licensing on the benefits of psychotherapy. And in fact, psychotherapy broadly understood as helping somebody with a psychological problem is performed by a lot of people that aren't registered you know, professionals with PhDs. And if you've had some big psychological problem, I mean, maybe your friend helped you with that. Right? Maybe um, an elder in your community helped you. Maybe your family member helped you, and maybe they did a good job too, okay? So, um, and there are, there are other paraprofessionals like um, teachers or nurses or social workers who end up doing counseling in one way or another. Research has looked at, okay, when it works, why does it seem to work? What seems to work? It seems important that there's an empathetic, caring relationship Many people don't like being abused by their therapy providers. It actually does happen. People can be in emotionally abusive relationships with providers. And um, it's helpful when the therapist helps the person see things in a different way. And you, can, you can provide a different perspective. And, and it's important that they offer hope. At the end of the day, um, how you treat a problem should be based on the, the best available research evidence. You know, at one point, we all believed that uh, depressed people needed more serotonin than give them an SSRI, and now that some meta-analysis came out and said, actually, you know, maybe that, that's not the case. So we use the best available research evidence. And then, you know, your clinical judgment will come into play, and then the client should matter too. They come from a certain culture, they have certain values, preferences, circumstances. So you take all of those into consideration 
before you decide what to do. Sometimes people are not ready to change. Okay? So let's say that you're trying to help somebody, I don't know, say you're in a situation, more of a clinical situation where somebody's doing something to hurt themselves. Okay, let's take the example of drinking. Right? They might not be ready to change. And then what are you going to achieve by trying to, you know, force them and tell them how they're going to die and how terrible it is and how they're upsetting everyone? Is that going to work? Or are they just going to stop coming to see and drop out of treatment? So if the person is in that kind of place, like maybe, maybe the right thing to do is just kind of keep a relationship going, right? keep a conversation going. Maybe you can bring them to a place where they might be kind of yellow like on changing and where they're, they could consider advantages or disadvantages. You might help them think about that in the context of their values. They love their children. And I mean, maybe like to be there to see them graduate. Okay, you can work with their values. And then when a person is in place when they're actually ready to change, that's the time to start um, using goal setting interventions okay, and strategies to actually change it. You're just getting kind of a right time for that and maybe a wrong time for that. It's important to keep in mind that sometimes treatments hurt. Okay? They can, there are programs that seem to increase the problems. Um, you know, these things where uh, police officers would come into school and say that drugs are bad seem to increase use of, uh, drug use in kids. seem to be especially ineffective in racialized areas where there's um, worse relationships with you know, the white police officers who are coming in. It's time to talk about resilience. You've probably heard about resilience and you may feel that you ought to be resilient, that other people should be resilient. Resilience is a wonderful thing, a precious thing and a special thing, but there are some ethical issues with expecting resilience. And that has to do with the fact that resilience refers to successful adaptation in the face of disabling environments. Resilience is one of the core values of St. Mary's University. Demonstrating resilience. That's expected of you as an organization member. You should demonstrate resilience. Let's think about what that means. People who show successful outcomes in the face of disabling circumstances demonstrate resilience. They're the people who succeeded despite the odds, those whose failure was predicted because in our observation, other people with similar characteristics and similar situation, other people who were poor, other people who were drug addicted, other people who were racialized, other people who struggled with disabilities and so on, other people with similar characteristics and similar situations did not make it. They're not expected to make it. Resilience is about unexpectedly successful outcomes. So resilient individuals are outliers. They represent error in our models, the times that our expectations were happily wrong. That's what it means for somebody to beat the odds. So resilience isn't something we can really observe and measure at a population or at a workforce level. We infer it from survival, unexpected survival. And so to understand resilience scientifically, we listen openly to the stories of those individuals who were unexpectedly successful, who beat the odds. And while those stories are diverse and deeply personal, Qualitative researchers have found similar themes that emerge across these different stories. And what those qualitative researchers learned is that people who demonstrated resilience found the resources that they needed to manage the situation. And maybe those resources are internal. It could be about skills or attitudes. Maybe they're external. Maybe they're about social capital access to education and opportunity. Think about the items from an internationally validated measure of resilience in youth by Michael Unger and colleagues at Dalhousie University. 
My family stands by me during difficult times. I know where to go in the community to get help. I have people I look up to. I have opportunities to develop skills that will be useful later in life. Young people around the world who say yes to those questions are the ones who tend to achieve those unexpectedly successful outcomes, even when they live under significant adversity. Those items are really measures of accessible resources, and are often those that lie deep in the heart of community. Some items are about how the person responds to challenges, like I'm able to solve problems without harming myself or others. So this purported measure of youth resilience, it's developed by academics in the fields of sociology and epidemiology, is actually a predictor of resilient outcomes. Not really a measure of resilience as a trait. It's a measure of adaptability resources, adapting responses, and it puts a strong focus on social resources. So is it ethical for organizations like ours to expect resilience from people as a matter of course? Well, you might ask, what are we doing to help people, right? to help employees, to help students say yes to questions like that? Right? What are we doing about those disabling circumstances that are the barriers to their success? Your textbook describes preventative mental health programs that can work to build resilience. I would say they might work to help achieve resilient outcomes by increases, increasing people's adaptability. And those programs are based on the idea that many psychological disorders, many mental illnesses could be prevented by changing oppressive, damaging environments into more benevolent and nurturing ones that foster growth and self-confidence. Community psychologists are the kind of people that think about those questions, right? What can we do to help support people in communities to achieve better outcomes? Your textbook defines resilience as a personal strength that helps most people cope with stress and recover from adversity and trauma. I disagree. Um, I agree with researchers who view resilience as an outcome, as unexpected success in the face of disabling circumstances. What predicts that is adaptability. And adaptability draws on your personal strengths, right? your, your skills, your endurance, your attitudes, your talents, etc., and also on your social resources, on your friends, and your family, and your community, and the systems you're in, and how well those support you. Okay. And if you can use those resources well, then maybe you can achieve that successful outcome, even unexpectedly. Resilience is ultimately about successful adaptation. It's about the achievement of desirable results and in the face of disabling circumstances. What do we know about adaptation? Well, it depends on your readiness to use your resources and to use them, you have to know them, and they have to be good ones in order to respond to challenges in ways that achieve the results that you want. Let's take a look at the predictors of you know, mental illness from your textbook. Risk factors for mental illness and protective factors. What themes do we see here? Well, notice that a lot of the risk factors have to do with low resources. 
okay? Maybe poor health, medical illness, being born with some complications. You have low resources if you can't sleep or if you're in pain. What if instead of having a supportive family, you have an abusive family where there's a lot of conflict? Your resources are going to be low if you're poor or if they're tied up in caring for others. And stressful life events will sap your resources. Now, other risk factors refer to your ability to respond. If you've grown up with abuse and neglect, well, can we expect you to have the adult skills that you need in order to act adaptively? Maybe you didn't learn those. Okay. Poor work skills and habits refers to maladaptive responding. Disabilities um, mean that you have a functional, lim functional limitation to your responding, that you'll have to find a way to work around or maybe find an environment that um, is a better fit. Substance abuse is never a good way to respond to your, your problems. Now, let's look at um, the protective factors. Again, they're about resources and about responses. Okay. Exercise and, and good diet will improve your health. That's a resource. Wealth is a resource. Okay. Empowerment, economic independence, security, those refer to class privilege. If you have feelings of mastery and control, maybe it's because you actually have mastery and control. Social support from family and friends is a resource. And what about adaptive responding? Well, maybe that means you have good problem solving skills. Maybe it means you cope well with stress and adversity. Right? You could have, have good social and work skills. When people respond in ways that are maladaptive, when they misuse their resources, that can lead to poor outcomes. And poor outcomes can sap your resources. And that can lead to even more maladaptive responding. And that can lead to further bad results that then further deplete your resources. So you can see how this can be a, a vicious cycle. So let's say um, you have low resources, low personal resources, don't really care about, uh, about your grades. So you go and uh, party instead of studying. That's a maladaptive response. And now you get a bad grade. And then maybe that depletes your confidence and you feel bad about yourself. And you think, why bother? I'm not going to study. You know, you get another bad grade. And next thing you know, you're on academic probation and maybe you fucked up. So we see how that's a vicious cycle. But you can break out of those vicious cycles with adaptive responding. And you could even get yourself stuck in an upward spiral. And I hope you do. So if you use your resources well and then you get a good result, that good result is now going to add to your resources. And then you can go and use them well again and succeed again. Right? And so you grow and develop in, in a good direction. So let's say that you, you care about your grades. And so you go and use that concern in, in an adaptive way. You go and you study. Then you get a good result, like a high grade. Well, that high grade could buffer you against a low grade that happened because of your bad luck. Okay? And so you cope with it better. And you go on to continue acting more adaptively because your resources are supporting you and buffering you. 
and get better results. And now you're in an upward spiral. So thank you for your time. Make good choices, and I'll see you next week.